Good morning, everyone. I'm Zach Walker, City Manager for the City of Independence. We're continuing our City Manager Job Shadow Series today. We're going to be hanging out with uh, Power and Light Department and spending time with Eric Holder. Eric, uh, tell me what your job title is here at Power and Light. So, uh, Zach, I'm the Environmental Health and Safety Supervisor for Power and Light. And um, I've been here with Power and Light for uh, about 13 years now. Awesome, awesome. So, so tell me a little bit about uh, your role. What, what are your day-to-day -day, uh, activities you're involved with? So if I could just back up a little bit uh -huh. and um, kind of give a summary, I guess, uh, yeah. of the program. Um, so for, as you're well aware, uh, the City of Independence has a proud history of over 100 years of uh, powering independence. Yeah. Actually 120 years now, so because 1901 was that first, Very cool. first year, so this would be our 120th year. Sure. Um, which that light plant on the wall there, if Meg wanted to take a quick picture of it, is that is that first plant that we had in independence down there. So, but uh, anyway, uh, one of the big aspects of uh, continuing to generate here within the city is um, complying with all of the environmental and health and safety regulations that we have in one of the most hazardous industries um, in the nation. Yeah. So it's one of the top 10 most hazardous, yeah. both to the environment and right. to uh -huh. human health. So um, our, um, our reason for being uh -huh. here with the utility as the Environmental Health and Safety Division is to protect our people and the environment from those hazards. Um, we literally have hundreds of environmental regulations that we have to comply with. Yeah. Um, so we, um, I was just telling Meg this morning, we have 300, over 300 reports that we have to submit wow. to regulatory agencies throughout the course of the year. Uh -huh. So with that number of reports mm -hmm. that we have to generate, we use, um, you know, software packages mm -hmm. to help us keep track of all that. Yeah. Um, and mainly a planning right. uh, thing. But uh, so, but our little division here of three people have to keep up with all that and um, write those reports, submit those reports. So uh, James will be with you this morning, uh, cool. taking you to a couple of different sites, uh, Blue Valley uh, uh -huh. substation, um, and showing you one aspect of our environmental program, yeah. that of water protection, uh -huh. um, which is just one small aspect of what we do. Yeah. But he'll show you groundwater protection. He's going to show you surface water protection, spill protection for some of our storage. So, but uh, hopefully, you know, it'll be and uh, be uh, fun and enlightening. Yeah. So, okay, we've made our way out to the Blue Valley Power Plant out here on Truman Road. Uh, we are now joined by James Barry, who works in our Environmental Health and Safety Unit at Power and Light. Uh, James, tell us what we're looking at here and a little bit about what you do uh, on site here. All right. Uh, so today we are taking a look at some of our tanks that we have here in the garage section. Uh, the federal government has us uh, regulatory. We, they watch over the tanks. Uh, we have to do inspections on a monthly basis. So we're out here taking a look at the tanks. Uh, these are tanks for, for uh, our vehicles. The uh, mechanics are putting in motor oil and hydraulic oil and engine oil. So we go through and we make sure everything is looking good on the tanks, fill out the paperwork, and if people say, well, what would happen if we didn't do this? Uh, the federal government would say it's uh, up to a $25,000 per violation per day fine. Okay. So we're saving people money by not having these violations. So motor oil obviously is for all your fleet here at Power and Light. Mm -hmm. Uh, tell us about the hydraulic oil and the engine oil. Uh, the engine oil is also for some of our uh, our trucks and things here. Hydraulic oil is for our equipment, uh, uh, for lifts and stuff like that. Right. So, and we're going to go through the uh, garage and you can kind of take a look on some of the pictures of uh, what's going on here today. Okay, James, we're out here in the, the maintenance yard at uh, Power and Light. There's a lot of rusty equipment behind us. Uh, tell us what we're looking at here. <laughs> what we have here, we have uh, transformers that have either their life expectancy is done, they're, they need to be replaced, or a motorist has struck a pole and knocked it off a pole. And so what we are doing here is, uh, in a cost-saving move, we're able to take these transformers and we have a uh, contractor that'll come in and redo them, make put all the new innards in them, make it all perfectly good, 
and then we can use them back since our uh, our transformer uh, is uh, backlogged on trying to get new transformers. So it, it saves us money that way. But inside there's oil in these transformers. And some of the older ones might have PCB impacted oil, and which is bad for the environment. And so what we, the guys here do, they take a sample of the oil, I take the sample, get it tested, and then we know uh, what kind of impact it has and w where the oil has to go to be properly disposed of. And you were telling us that just like consumers are seeing delays in getting some of their orders or shipments made because of COVID and other factors, you're experiencing that same thing here at Power & Light. Same thing here at Power & Light. Uh, while it may look like we have a large inventory, uh, we, we really don't. Uh, we're at looking at about a year out on some of the deliveries. So this is all just to keep the lights on in Independence right now, so. Very cool. So this is all about guarding against um, you know, outages and things of that nature because if there has been damage to some of this equipment, we try to make sure that we can replace it quickly. Correct, yeah, because we want to get the lights back on and then uh, the, the teams that do the, the uh, linemen come in and they will drop it off and then we have our, our guys here in the warehouse that will take care of it and sample it and then uh, we'll get rid of it and properly disposed of. And not only properly disposing of it, making sure we protect both the environment and our staff who interact with this. A absolutely, yeah. The first and foremost is safety around here. And uh, we make sure ever when we're dealing with these chemicals and, and oils that we are using proper PPE or protection and, uh, and uh, keeping things uh, in proper containers. So. All right. So these are going to be shipped out to be redone here probably in the next couple weeks. Okay. Thanks. Yep. Okay, James, you've walked us out here to this lovely little pond. Um, I'm guessing we're not doing a lot of trout fishing in here. Could you tell us what the purpose of this pond is? Absolutely, yeah, there's no trout as of yet. <laughs> uh, this is our pole yard behind us, and this is a stormwater um, mitigation. We, what we have is, since we, our poles are behind us, they have a, a chemical called PCP that uh, it can leach off the poles. And since we have such a high number of poles here, we want to protect the stormwater flowing off our property going into the streams surrounding us, the little blue and the ditches around here, the farmers nearby. So what uh, Rick Lunsford and I helped design is uh, we were having troubles with the chemical coming down here. And one thing that breaks down the chemical really good is sunlight. So we slow down the stormwater coming in here. It sits in this pond. Sunlight breaks down the chemical and then as, when it rains, the pond will raise an elevation and go out the outfall so that we're protecting the uh, environment that way. So this is a relatively new addition um, out here. Yeah, we started it right during when COVID started and then uh, we were able to design it and then our own team, uh, workers up here in the warehouse, the union guys all came in here and built it. Uh, Rick did all the, uh, uh, the planning and I put in my little two cents and so it's a, it's a nice little stormwater detention pond. Well, a lot of people picked up hobbies during COVID. You found a way to save the environment, a way to make me feel small. One little step. <laughs> <laughs> okay, James, you let me drive the four by four, which I'm not sure you're questioning that decision now. It was fun. <laughs> but we had a good time, got to let our rural Missouri come out. That's right. Um, but now anyway, we're out here at the old coal ash pond, you've told me. Uh, tell me what this area would have looked like uh, once upon a time and now why it looks like pasture land. Yeah, once upon a time, this is where all the uh, coal fly ash would be uh, put out here and uh, it was ponds. And uh, once we start going from burning coal, we had a, there was a time that the federal government said, hey, we'd like you to, there's beneficial rules to get rid of the fly ash ponds so that we, Independence is one of the first ones to step in and said, let's get rid of them. So what happened is they removed the ash and then they capped it. And now as part of the remediation, we're gonna to check to see what the, the groundwater is doing. And so we're upgrading it right now. So this well, we are gonna gauge to see what the depth of the water is. And then we come out here quarterly and we'll sample the well for different constituents to see how it impacted the stormwater or groundwater or it isn't. And so when you take these readings quarterly, that gets reported to different agencies? It, it goes to the Missouri Department of Natural Resources, and then I'm sure they report it on up to the EPA. Okay. So. All right, so show me uh, what I need to do here so, to measure this. So we're going to turn it on. 
And so this little probe, when it detects water, it's going to start beeping. Okay. And then uh, north is this way. So we always take the measurement. I marked it right here mm -hmm. for north. And you're just going to unwind it slow and see, uh, see when uh, we hit water. And why do we face north? Uh, it's just an easy, easy way of keeping track. So uh, if everybody measures from north, it's a consistent reading. So we don't, because the pipe sometimes is not exactly uh, uh, equal on top. So. Gotcha. So we found water. So we'll bring it back up. Okay. You're good. And so we have to, what you have to do is we're going to find that where, right there. Now you have to tell me what the reading is. At the top of the pipe? Yep. All right, we are at 14.1 feet. 14.1 feet. Mm -hmm. So I'll put that down in the notes and uh, we only have nine more wells to do. All right, now how is that, tell me what that number means. It just gives us an idea of uh, groundwater flow and uh, it will fluctuate over the year. Will it get, come up, will it go down? Uh, so it gives us an idea of how much water is moving through here through the ground. Okay. Okay, James, I left my awesome side-by-side -side behind. You've brought us over here to Substation I. It's located just off of Lee Summit Road by the Drum Farm Golf Course. Um, behind us are some tanks that you're going to tell us about in a minute. We've come here today on a much warmer July day, but a few months ago back in February, our residents will recall that we had the polar vortex go through. There was a lot of demand for uh, natural gas as everybody was trying to heat their homes and power and light had to participate in some rolling blackouts. Um, tell us about these tanks and how it related to that February event. Right, so these tanks are, uh, they contain fuel oil and this is a generating sub so we're able to generate electricity here. Uh, typically they're only called on during days of extreme heat or extreme cold so they're not called on all the time. Uh, during the polar vortex uh, these tanks we just had trucks lined up here offloading fuel into this to keep it going uh, in fact uh, I don't even think most of the fuel it was just a it was going in the tank and going right into our combustion turbines down there as fast as we could pump it in just to keep electricity but with these tanks uh, we worry about spills and we worry about uh, other environmental items with this fuel oil so uh, part of the things um, 40 hour has whopper train so if we have a spill I'd be the one that come out and uh, figure out how bad the spill is and do we need help, uh, that type of thing. I keep uh, equipment in my car, in the very back of the electric car there, that uh, I'm not going to be able to clean up a whole tank like this, but I can find out where it is, get it uh, stopped, and then uh, call in the Calvary to have us help. And James, how do we prevent a catastrophic event like that from occurring? What are some of the precautions that you and your team take to make sure that doesn't happen? Right, we, uh, we come out here on a monthly and uh, inspect the tanks and the piping associated with it. We check the, the containment around it, secondary containment, so that if we were to have a catastrophic fail of a tank, it's just going to pool here and it's not going to go to the golf course, it's not going to go to the library, or it's not going to flow down to the uh, generating station. And so uh, with all, or all the compliance issues, uh, the state and the feds make us uh, check the tanks. Uh, they come in and the tanks are checked uh, periodically to make sure that there's no failures in the rivets or uh, construction of it. So. I want to revisit the February polar vortex event again. You were telling us on our drive over here how much fuel oil was used in that event compared to a normal period of time. Right. So when, uh, when the trucks were coming up, on a normal time, we may get one or two trucks to fuel this up, so we're prepared for emergency. At that time, uh, we take samples from each uh, tanker truck so we can tell what the heat content is. And we ran out of bottles. We could physically not find any laboratory to give us bottles. Uh, it was uh, thousands and thousands of gallons going through this in an hour, you know. So uh, we, the, the guys and the gals, they were here 24 seven, making sure the trucks were coming, trying to get fuel was a, was a problem at times. So we were really, I mean, uh, I've only been here two years, but it was a real team effort. Everybody pitched in. Uh, I'm trying to find bottles for my little part and trying to find out, all right, 
uh, who do we need to call for more fuel oil? Because uh, everybody in the region was having the same problem. Now, when you're talking bottles, I'm picturing little Windex bottles. What? What? Uh, little jars, about yay big, that uh -huh. hold about four to six ounces. Uh -huh. And so the laboratory uh, that we use is able to take that and they get uh, BTUs. Okay. How much heat content is in it? Okay. And then that goes into our air permitting. Uh, on a normal time, uh, we may fuel this. Uh, you know three or four times a year. Uh -huh. That time we were, it was a 24 hour, you know, I don't know, five, six days in a row. Wow. Yeah. How many of these fuel tanks do we have uh, in Power and Light in the system? So we have three generating subs. Mm -hmm. uh, the other one is at J across from the old sermon center. Right. And it does, uh, it has fuel oil. And then H is up on 291 highway. And it is, it can do fuel oil, but it also does, uh, natural gas. Okay. So we'd like to burn a natural gas, but during the polar vortex, H, we couldn't get natural gas. Okay. So uh, the guys made a great call and decided to switch over to fuel oil, and that's what kept the lights on. Gotcha. Now if we can swing around over here, can you tell me uh, what we're looking at down here, this piece of equipment? So these are the combustion turbines. Uh, the fuel oil is going to come out of the tank and go underground to those, and this is what's going to be generating your electricity. And then to the left of that is just more substation that regulates electricity and where it's going and how much and that type of thing. So these turbines, when they kick on, you'd hear them. They're loud. Uh, they burn the fuel oil. Uh, it's a nice quiet day today. But uh, on your really hot summer days, we might be called on to turn these on. Yeah, and just so our citizens can connect the dots, our council is considering right now how best to uh, repair uh, and or replace uh, this equipment. It is a little bit older, uh, has some efficiency issues, I understand. The efficiency, uh, there's some efficiency issues. Uh, they still run, they still do what they need to do, but uh, just like anything, new technology, it's better and easier and more cost efficient. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, eventually these will hit their end of life at some point but they're in great condition right now so and specifically with your team again what are some of the um, precautions you take um, from a safety standpoint so if we were to be in the actual um, substation uh -huh. we'd be changing to uh, FR clothing uh -huh. uh, so in case of uh, uh, FR is fire resistant. So, yeah. Okay. In case uh, we would have electrical flash, mm -hmm. and so that uh, we'd be protected that way. Uh, we also have uh, underground storage tanks down there. So when uh, if there was emergency shutoff, the fuel just doesn't get dumped. It goes into a tank, and then we properly dispose of it at a later date. So. Okay. But uh, it's a, it's a, it's an oldie, but a really goodie. <laughs>